welcome everyone to Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are honored to have a Grand Round speaker, Dr. Shafkat Anwar. Dr. Shafkat Anwar is Director of Pediatric Heart Center MRI and 3D programs. He's also the co-director for Center for Advanced 3D Technology and Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Radiology. He's also the founding member and inaugural chair of the Advanced 3D Visualization Special Interest Group in the Society for Cardiovascular MRI. Dr. Anwar completed his internship and residency in pediatrics at Children's National Medical Center, as well as research fellowship at National Institute of Health. He completed his fellowships in pediatric cardiology and cardiac imaging at Cleveland Clinic and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, prior to joining UCSF, Dr. Anwar was cardiology director of cardiac MRI at Washington University in St. Louis and at St. Louis's Children's Hospital. At Washington University, Dr. Anwar co-founded and co-directed the Center for 3D Printing, a multidisciplinary 3D printing center. Thank you so much, Dr. Anwar, for joining us today and uh, for giving the grand rounds. The topic today is overview of MRI in pediatric and congenital heart disease. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I've um, seen great things about this organization, and I truly believe in its mission, and it's just my privilege to be able to you know, share this talk with the group today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about MRI and also what we're calling 3D plus technologies in pediatric and congenital heart disease. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, gadolinium uh, use is off-label uh, in pediatric cardiac MRI. And I'm also a, a consultant and shareholder in Printer Press, which is a startup in the Bay Area using 3D printing technologies for medical device manufacturing. My other disclosure is more of a disclaimer that I am an equal opportunity imaging fanatic and an agnostic. And what I mean by that is I love imaging. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and I'm a cardiac imager. And it doesn't really matter to me what modality we use. We're all looking at the heart. So whether it's echo, CT, MR, or angiography with cardiac cath, it's just a different way of looking at the same heart. And it is kind of with that philosophy I'm gonna enter into this talk while I focus on cardiac MRI. I wanna take a step back for a second and talk about the big picture a little bit. Because while I'm talking about pediatric cardiology and cardiac imaging, the story that I hope to craft for you is one of determination and one of innovation. And I think these are the things that drive us in medicine in general. Um, and I wanna share a story that was sent to me by my friend, Dr. Kapanil, who is over at Ames. Uh, it's the Amrit Institute of Medical Sciences in Kochi, India. And Dr. Kapanil is a cardiologist just like myself. And he's a fan of 3D printing like myself. And he shared a story about one of his patients that was just fascinating to me. And I wanted to share this with you. This is Hari, and I have Hari's permission to share his story. He has complex congenital heart disease. His heart disease was diagnosed when he was about 17 years of age, and he just got progressively more and more tired. And Dr. Kapanil discovered that Hari would need pretty complex heart surgery in order to fix his heart condition. Now, he had been turned down for heart surgery at several centers in India already, but when Dr. Kapanil started working with Hari, he realized that Hari kind of had a hidden talent. Uh, he was a fan of 3D printing technologies, and Dr. Kapanil is a cardiac imager. And putting their heads together, they were actually able to 3D print out a model of his heart. And this is that model of Hari's heart that they printed in India. And using that model, they planned his surgery. They ultimately operated and fixed very complex heart disease with a good outcome. This is Hari today. Uh, this is on a recent visit that Hari had to the Mayo Clinic prior to the COVID pandemic. And this is him in what I imagine to be a Disney World for him. Uh, he is at their 3D printing center, one of the largest 3D printing centers anywhere. And I just love seeing that smile on his face. And I think this is why we do medicine. This is why we get into pediatrics. We want to be able to help and we want our patients to have the best outcomes, no matter where they are. But I chose this story to kick us off because it uses cardiac imaging to its best capabilities, I think. So the objectives of my talk today is to briefly review the multimodality options we have in cardiac imaging. I want to provide an introduction to cardiac MRI, and I'd like to be frank about its strengths and limitations as one of the imaging modalities we have. 
and I would like to review the clinical applications of MRI in pediatric and congenital heart disease. We will, of course, just be scratching the surface, and I'll tend to be more broad as opposed to going into depth in some of these applications. And finally, I'd like to briefly discuss an advanced application of cardiac MRI, which is 3D printing and some 3D plus technologies. So very briefly, I'm going to summarize here some of the advantages and disadvantages from my standpoint in multimodality cardiac imaging. We are frankly fortunate in 2020, we've got several options. Echo, as we all know, is ubiquitous. Cardiac ultrasound is accessible. It's relatively inexpensive. It's non-invasive and it has no ionizing radiation associated with it. Echo is also very powerful because it provides great spatial resolution of very thin structures. Probably some of the best ways to look at AV valves, atrial septum, cordae, etc., come from echocardiography. It also has high temporal resolution and there's very few reasons not to use echocardiography, very few contraindications. The disadvantages are also quite significant. As patients get larger, there's limitations in their acoustic windows due to their body habitus, lung can get in the way. There's very limited visualization sometimes of structures outside the heart, such as vasculature. And also when doing volumetrics and evaluating function, or more advanced calculations, we have to make several geometric assumptions about heart size, heart shape. That is a limitation of echo. And frankly, all of echo we're imaging off axis in oblique planes, except for maybe a couple of planes. And there are some disadvantages as far as evaluation of velocities. Of course, we have cardiac cath, which in pediatric cardiology was one of the most original uh, imaging modalities. Um, it is no longer used here in the United States at least, for just visualization, but for certain applications such as selective imaging of coronaries or mapping of aerodopulmonary collaterals, still very, very powerful just for visualization. But of course, cardiac cath gives you assessments of pressure and resistance, which no other imaging modality routinely can give you. Issues with echo include it's expensive, it is invasive, and there's a significant amount of ionizing radiation and contrast associated. Moving on from echo, we have cardiac, pardon me, moving on from CT, uh, from cath, we have cardiac CT, which gives excellent spatial resolution, very good assessment of structures outside the heart, extracardiac structures, and a fast scan time. However, there are limitations, such as the ability to assess physiology and characterize cardiac tissue. And of course, there's issues with ionizing radiation, which especially in pediatrics, tends to be a significant limitation especially as it is cumulative over time. Finally, we come to cardiac MRI, the topic of today's lecture. One big advantage as an imager that I like for MRI is that you have unlimited imaging planes, as long as you don't have artifact producing substances such as metal. You can get great assessment of extracardiac structures. You can characterize tissue, which frankly, none of the other imaging modalities can do as well. You get a very precise assessment of physiology and function and quantification of flow. And MRI is considered the non-invasive gold standard of functional cardiac evaluation. And a huge bonus is that there is no ionizing radiation with cardiac MRI. There are disadvantages though, of course. Uh, MRI tends to be expensive. Um, you have a longer scan time than CT and sometimes equivalent to echo. That may be a surprising statement because we tend to think of echo as relatively fast, but when you think of complex congenital heart disease, sometimes we're taking up to an hour, maybe more than an hour to do a complex study. Sometimes we have to go back for repeat scans. And sometimes if you compare echo for a complex patient versus MRI for that same patient, it may well be that echo takes as long as cardiac MRI. There are requirements for sedation in cardiac MRI in certain populations, which can be a limitation. And of course, there's limitations related to metal in the chest or other devices such as pacemakers, et cetera. And frankly, there is concern about contrast that is used for MRI and resultant deposition within the brain. To date, there has been no negative effects of brain deposition of contrast that has been shown in the literature, but it is something we're keeping a close eye on and trying to limit the amount of contrast we give our patients. So 
focusing just on cardiac MRI, this is kind of a schema I'd like to use to think about the applications of MRI and its capabilities. At the base of the pyramid, probably the most basic way we use cardiac MRI is to characterize anatomy and basic physiology. And moving on from there, we can characterize tissue and then characterize complex anatomy and physiology, such as single ventricles and other complex congenital heart disease. And finally, we can apply MRI for advanced applications, such as 3D printing, assessment of four-dimensional flow, cardiac strain, etc. And I'll talk about some of these technologies during this lecture. I'd like to show the impact of cardiac MRI in a comprehensive congenital cardiac MRI program. In the blue here, I'm showing, quote unquote, the classic applications of cardiac MRI technologies in a pediatric heart center, such as the evaluation of congenital heart disease, planning for surgery, planning for interventional cardiac procedures, or assessment of valve disease and vasculopathy. Here on the green are other cardiac subspecialties that use cardiac MRI, such as electrophysiology, heart failure, transplant, and pulmonary hypertension. And as a tertiary and quaternary care referral facilities, we offer cardiac MRI for referring institutions or MRIs with our adult congenital heart disease colleagues. And moving outside of uh, the realms of pediatric cardiology, cardiac MRI can be used in other subspecialties, such as hematology to assess hemoglobinopathies and iron deposition, in the world of oncology to assess tumors or for surveillance after chemotherapy, and so on and so forth in the world of genetics, other surgical subspecialties, and neuromuscular disorders. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about in today's lecture is the evidence base for cardiac MRI, and in particular, cardiac MRI protocols. We are fortunate that a good degree of evidence exists in the uh, pediatric and congenital population, and this would be one of the papers that is very helpful. And hopefully in the video, you can review the paper and the references are provided. Uh, from 2013, these are the guidelines and protocols for cardiac MR in children and adults with congenital heart disease. And based on that, this is just an example of protocols that I use in my own practice uh, for congenital and pediatric uh, MRI scanning. I won't go through all of them, but basically we're looking at uh, complex heart disease, single ventricles, cardiomyopathy, valvular structure and function, vascular abnormalities, coronaries, shunt evaluation, tumors and mass, iron overload, et cetera, et cetera. Another resource I can guide you to is the YCMR page from the SCMR. You can follow this link. And here we've attempted to basically uh, provide summaries for the use cases of cardiac MRI in the pediatric and congenital population. Okay. I'm going to now pivot and talk about specific disease entities for which we apply cardiac MRI uh, in the congenital and pediatric populations. One of the classic indications for cardiac MRI is the follow-up of patients who've had repair of Tetralogy of Fallot. We're all familiar with this heart condition, and basically the repair involves the relief of obstruction to the right heart, closure of a VSD, and a valvotomy, usually a valvotomy, that results in free pulmonary regurgitation and increase in ventricular volumes over time of the right ventricle. And so MRI can be very helpful in assessing patients like this. And this is one of our older patients who is getting an evaluation. And here we can see the right ventricular outflow tract, a pulmonary valve, which is not very competent, significant pulmonary regurgitation, and we're seeing the same view here, significant pulmonary branch pulmonary arteries here, the LPA is quite bad, being shown by MRI. Now, one of the nicest things about MRI is quantification of ventricular volumes, and as this group knows, ventricular volumes and function of the right ventricle is one of the key indicators we use when deciding when to replace a pulmonary valve in a patient who's got repaired tetralogy fallot. And here what I'm doing is basically using cardiac MRI to take slices through the heart to provide a very precise calculation for what the ventricular size and ventricular function is. A little bit of detail on how we do that. We look at every slice from diastole to systole and literally can provide tracings that provide us the volumes 
that provide us information we need for diagnostic and clinical decision making. This is some of the evidence base behind using MRI data to guide us in timing pulmonary valve replacements. And there are now multimodality ways where we can track patients with cardiac MRI and echocardiography. And I find this paper in JACE 2014 to be particularly helpful in deciding clinically how to follow these patients and with how, um, how much frequency we should be applying cardiac MRI or echo technologies for following these patients. One of the applications that is a, a more advanced application in this population is the use of feature tracking to track the motion of the right ventricle. And here basically the computer is tracing a path line by which you're looking at the right heart and looking at the function of the right heart regionally. And if you're interested in reading further about this, uh, this is a paper I can point you towards showing the regional dysfunction that exists in patients with repaired tetralogy of flow. Pivoting away from tetralogy of flow, another indication for cardiac MRI in pediatric and congenital cardiac MRI is looking at aortic valve disease and aortopathy. This is a patient with bicuspid aortic valve, and you can see this restricted opening of the valve and a jet of aortic stenosis. And this is the same patient just using a different MRI sequence where I'm showing a regurgitant jet of aortic regurgitation hitting the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So that's good cine imaging used for qualitative evaluation. And one of the unique things that we can do with, car with cardiac MRI is quantitative evaluation. So this is the same patient as I was showing earlier, and now I've put a plane across which I can assess flow on these patients. So on this image on the right, I'm showing the aortic valve orifice and through which I'm looking at forward flow and reverse flow by which I can calculate the regurgitant fraction of this valve. And I can also look at the peak velocity that goes through this plane and calculate what the gradient is, the calculated pressure gradient in this patient with aortic stenosis. And one final picture, just looking at the anatomy of this particular valve. Uh, anatomy can be shown pretty nicely using cardiac MRI in a patient with the bicuspid aortic valve with fusion of the leaflets right here. Okay, as you know, um, many patients with aortic valve disease also have associated aortopathy, and I'm just using this case as one example of MRI capabilities for vascular imaging. So this is a patient with bicuspid aortic valve who also has a dilated ascending aorta. Not the worst case that I've seen, but I just wanted to stay along the theme of bicuspid aortic valve and basically show this data set. It's pretty high resolution. The resolution of cardiac MRI can get as low as about one millimeter isotropic voxel size, adequate for coronary imaging. Of course, CT can get further lower than that, down to 0.6, but for most cases, one millimeter isotropic is really not too bad, especially for large vessels. And then you can get into very um, precise planes where you can make orthogonal measurements for aortic dimensions, because as this group knows, uh, aortic dimensions is one of the ways, one of the criteria we assess for replacement of an aorta in patients with uh, valve disease. I uh, want to show a advanced application of patients um, from cardiac MRI data, patients with bicuspid aortic valve. This is using four-dimensional flow, and basically they're looking at streamlines of flow across um, stenotic valve. And if you're further interested, this is the paper that you could, we can direct you to. Very nice paper that basically looked at different types of aortic valve disease and association with aortopathy. Okay. I'm gonna move now from quote unquote simple heart disease, such as valve disease, to more complex congenital heart disease and the use of cardiac MRI in these patients. I'm gonna talk first about a patient with hypoplastic left heart. Uh, one of my own patients, uh, this patient currently has a Glen, a superior cable pulmonary connection. And we did a cardiac MRI in this patient in preparation for the next phase of single ventricle palliation, which would be a Fontan. And this is the patient's large right ventricle. This is the very small diminutive left ventricle as he has hypoplastic left heart disease. And this is the dilated annulus. And here's some tricuspid valve prolapse with some resultant tricuspid regurgitation. 
overall, the function looks pretty good. Um, this is looking at the same patient's outflows, looking at the new aortic valve, looking at the native aortic valve, which as you can see is very, very small, but this is the main outflow at this point. And here is where I think MRI has some power over echocardiography. Now echocardiography is the workhorse of cardiology and pediatrics, and I predict it's gonna stay that way for quite some time, and for good reason. Echo is very powerful technology. But sometimes you get into situations like this. This is that same patient I was showing earlier, and we're trying to look at the superior cable pulmonary connection where the patient's superior vena cava is connected to the pulmonary arteries and blood flow is going passively to the lungs. But these are the patient's echo windows, not really very helpful. And this is the same patient and we're showing the same anatomy by cardiac MRI. So here's the SVC, the left denominate vein and the SVC connecting to the pulmonary arteries. Here you see the pulmonary arteries more distally. This right pulmonary artery looks completely fine but this left pulmonary artery is narrowed, and this is what it looks like in the superior, inferior dimension. And it is a bit narrowed, and we thought that this may need to be repaired at the time of this patient's Fontan surgery. Same patient, different MRI sequence. I wanted to show you MR angiography. Particularly helpful in patients with single ventricles for us to assess the amount of aortopulmonary collaterals these patients can develop. So this is a lower extremity injection. We're seeing the contrast come up, go into the single ventricle, go out of the aorta, go into the vessels off of the transverse arch and come back through the SVC, out to the pulmonary arteries, out to the lungs. And this sort of injection would let you evaluate for any major aortopulmonary collaterals that may be coming off the aorta. Just a volume rendered image showing the anatomy of the branch pulmonary arteries. And exact, same exact data set, just showing volume rendering, very simple to do. Same exact patient and giving a kind of a 3D picture, if you will, of the anatomy, including the arch, branch pulmonary arteries, etc. So MRI can be a very powerful assessment uh, or provides a very powerful assessment of uh, anatomy in single ventricle patients. What it also provides is an assessment of physiology. And I won't dive too much into the details of these studies, but we can assess aortopulmonary collaterals by cardiac MRI while established in the literature. And these collaterals are shown to have negative impact on outcomes in our single ventricle patients. I'll direct you to these papers that you can look at. And of course, in our patients with single ventricles, they tend to have diseases outside the cardiovascular system extending to the lymphatic system, which is a whole separate circulation that we can um, investigate nicely with cardiac MRI, as shown by Dori et al. in a series of very nice articles. And this is the type of lymphatic imaging that can be performed with cardiac MRI sequences. And this is not angiography, but lymph angiography where we're looking at dilated lymphatics that can be intervened upon to improve some of the outcomes in our patients with single ventricles. I'm gonna pivot yet once again, away from complex congenital heart disease to our patients with cardiomyopathy. Now, this is a paper, review paper from um, Mayer et al. in uh, 2009, mainly showing some of the largest reasons for sudden cardiac death uh, in the pediatric and congenital population. And I'll talk about some of these disease entities as they can be investigated well by cardiac MRI. One of them is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is one of my former patients with a thick ventricular septum. And the power of cardiac MRI is one, characterizing the type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because as this group knows well, there is not just a single flavor of cardiac pardon me, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but rather various phenotypes that may be associated with different types of outcome on these patients. However, echocardiography may not have the type of spatial resolution needed to characterize the phenotype of HCM as well that cardiac MRI can provide. The other thing cardiac MRI provides is assessment of the actual tissue, a virtual biopsy, if you will, of what the heart muscle is made of. In this case, we're looking at a technique called delayed 
enhancement or late gadolinium enhancement. And these structures here, these regions here in bright are regions where there's either fibrosis of scarring within the myocardium. Now we know that these can be nidoses of ventricular arrhythmias and some of these arrhythmias can be fatal. Or these can be reasons why a patient develops dysfunction and heart failure over time. There have been several large studies, mostly in the adult population, showing the negative impacts of delayed enhancement and also the extent of enhancement in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population. And the prognostic value of LGE in HCM patients was shown nicely in large populations in several studies. At this point in time, the, the existence of delayed enhancement in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is not necessarily a class one indicator for a ICD placement or implantable cardiac defibrillator. However, the existence of late gadolinium enhancement in the heart is rising in the literature as a reason to consider an ICD placement. I'm gonna pivot from HCM to myocarditis, but I'm gonna keep the theme of delayed enhancement because you will see that myocarditis, while it is a different disease mechanism than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, still ends up with scarring in the heart and you may still develop bad outcomes from having scar in the heart, only shown by cardiac MRI. So myocarditis is characterized by edema, hyperemia, and fibrosis and scarring in the heart. And in this paper from 2009 and Jack, um, the evidence was put forth as far as the evaluation of myocarditis by cardiac MRI and the criteria by which we can diagnose um, myocarditis in our patients. Essentially, when one develops inflammation within the heart, it shows up on cardiac MRI with some hallmark characteristics. One of those characteristics is T2 enhancement, <coughs> which we believe indicates myocardial edema. Now, this is a patient which, who is showing myocardial enhancement or T2 signal that is at least double the surrounding skeletal muscle. And same patient that is also showing T1 enhancement, which we believe is associated with hyperemia or capillary leak. Again, hallmarks of inflammation. Same patient who's also showing fibrosis or scarring within the heart, which could be a further um, evolution of inflammation and hyperemia leading to fibrosis and scarring in a non-coronary distribution, which is shown nicely with cardiac MRI. So putting these three imaging sequences together on MRI, we achieve quite a high sensitivity and specificity for detecting myocarditis, certainly when compared to cath cardiac catheterization, which is the gold standard for diagnosing myocarditis, MRI is helpful because as we all know, cardiac cath also has a high false negative rate. If you're not sampling in the area where you have active myocardial inflammation, you may actually end up missing myocarditis from cardiac cath. However, cardiac MRI provides a global evaluation of the myocardium and can also provide targets for subsequent cardiac cath if needed to prove the diagnosis. The Lake Louise criteria that was established in the 2009 JAK paper that I just showed you was recently updated to also include parametric mapping techniques. Again, I will not go into the details of these techniques for time purposes, but I wanted to include it because it is an update and more can be found about this updated Lake Louise criteria in this paper from Jack. Okay, so importantly for clinical cardiologists, um, LGE or late gadolinium enhancement is also associated with bad outcomes in myocarditis, just as it was in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or even other types of non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Essentially, these, these studies shown with fairly large population with good follow-ups, both show presence and pattern of LGE is associated with worse outcomes. Pivoting from myocarditis to coronary anomalies by cardiac MRI, when we think of the non-invasive evaluation of coronaries beyond 
echocardiography, we often think of CT, which is an excellent modality for looking at cornea abnormalities because of high spatial resolution, but MRI is very good as well. Um, again, this is one of my own patients, uh, cardiac MRI done on a 1.5 Tesla MRI scanner. And as I scroll through this axial set of images, you will see that this is the right coronary artery, and this is the left coronary artery. This is the LAD left circumflex, and I will show the coronaries coming back to the aortic root. And there you will notice that the right coronary artery is coming off anomalously from the left coronary cusp. So anomalous origin of the right coronary artery, shown by cardiac MRI. Again, we can reach spatial resolutions of a millimeter, sometimes sub-millimeter isotropic voxel with ability to show aneurysm. A separate patient that I helped take care of uh, with the coronary aneurysm associated with polyarteritis nodosa. And beyond just anatomy, uh, MRI has assessment of physiology as well and tissue characterization. So one of the applications of MRI is evaluation of myocardial ischemia via a perfusion study. Now, this is a perfusion sequence. I'll just let it play. And basically, as it plays again, what we're showing is there's contrast, just bright, coming into the right heart, coming into the left heart, and then areas that are showing up black and don't become nice and neutral gray are areas that we suspect has a perfusion defect. You can, as in this area right here, while the rest of the myocardium has normalized, we suspect there may be a perfusion defect here along the septum, and we're just looking at three slices. So basal septum and mid septum seems to be affected. And we can do this type of study at rest or with adenosine, which can mimic exercise physiology. Moving on from assessment of coronaries and perfusion, Cardiac MRI also lets you evaluate cardiac iron overload and cardiomyopathy. This is particularly helpful in our patients with hemoglobinopathies who tend to get chronic transfusions. And as this group knows, with chronic transfusions, there's chronic iron deposition in many parts of the body, specifically the liver, pancreas, but also the myocardium. And the literature shows as iron deposits in the myocardium, dysfunction can occur, leading to cardiomyopathy. And MRI has been well validated to evaluate cardiac iron overload, and now we have literature with survival curves showing us that a certain amount of iron deposition is associated with patients who go on to develop heart failure. Now, this technology and this application has been taken pretty far to basically helping guide our hematology colleagues in when chemotherapy may be indicated in patients with chronic iron overload, and then following them afterwards to see the effects of chemotherapy, but also doing surveillance to make sure our patients don't develop um, heart failure and frank dysfunction and cardiomyopathy. So with that, I'm gonna conclude the first portion of this talk, which is mainly about cardiac MRI. My conclusions are that cardiac MRI is a powerful cardiac imaging modalities with some very unique capabilities that distinguish it from echo, CT, or angiography. MRI is applicable across a broad spectrum of pediatric and congenital heart disease, and we have well-developed protocols and a strong evidence base. There are several promising advanced applications for comprehensive cardiac evaluation using cardiac MRI. And I'm gonna pivot and talk about one of these advanced applications, which is 3D printing. I'm gonna take a step back and talk about some of the challenges we face in congenital heart disease. In a high complexity tertiary or quaternary care center, these are our challenges when talking about congenital heart disease. We're dealing with patients who are very vulnerable, their disease is complex, they are facing high risk surgery or sometimes multiple surgeries with compounding risk, there are multiple care teams involved, each with diverse experiences and perspectives, which is a strength, but also sometimes communication can be challenging. We're talking about very complex disease. And in pediatrics in particular, we're talking about our families as the agents of making decisions. So family counseling becomes very important for us. 
again, I'd like to use this schematic to talk about um, the scope of what I'm going to be discussing. And mainly, it's these advanced applications of cardiac imaging technologies, which include 3D printing, advanced visualization, 4D flow, or myocardial mechanics, such as strain. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus specifically on just 3D printing and some of the advanced visualization modalities that I'm calling extended reality. And this includes modalities like augmented, virtual, and mixed reality technologies, which we're using in patient care routinely. And to be frank, I'm not just talking about cardiac MRI here. Cardiac MRI is very powerful and produces high resolution imaging. But in our center, we take a multimodality approach, individualized to the patient, so we really target what the patient's clinical question is and work backwards to the imaging modalities that can be applied to address the clinical question in hopefully an economical manner. So we're not getting every test possible, but we're being focused and targeted in the technologies that we apply. And the technologies that we use include cardiac CT and 3D echocardiography. So just to put things in context, I'm going to show you a little bit about what is considered standard of care and contrast that to what we're using in our center with 3D print and other 3D plus technologies. As I mentioned earlier, echocardiography is extremely powerful. And this one echo sweep is actually showing very complex heart disease all in one sweep with echocardiography. Again, not having much time to go into the details of the anatomy, you have to trust me that this is, the patient, this is a patient with very abnormal connections between the atria and the ventricle, a large hole in the heart or a ventricular septal defect, and both of these patients' outflows are coming off of the right ventricle, so a double outlet right ventricle. So that's echocardiography. This is MRI, and the additive value of MRI is that we're getting a lot of extra cardiac imaging also. So this is the same exact patient, but we're discovering here that the patient has got complete lung collapse of the left lung and a kinking of the left pulmonary artery. Not sure if this is what caused the lung collapse or it happened because of the lung collapse, but we did not appreciate this from the patient's echo. And also this patient has some narrowing, narrowing of the aorta or a coarctation. And this is just volume rendered imaging a standard post-processing technique we can use from CT or MRI showing the coarctation. So all of this is considered standard of care currently in my facility. I'll contrast that with 3D print. A separate patient, but similarly complex anatomy. And what we do in our center is we take the sequences, the images from MRI or CT primarily, and we can literally print out these heart defects. So in this particular patient, I've cut away the inferior portions of the heart, and this patient has something called double outlet right ventricle, and I'm putting the probe through the patient's left ventricle and showing the surge on a potential pathway by which this patient can be repaired to have a two ventricle circulation. So essentially a patient who we think could undergo a two ventricle, very complex repair, intracardiac repair, we can hold the heart and practice the procedure. And cardiac 3D printing applications has, uh, cardiac 3D printing, pardon me, has several applications. They can range from complex congenital heart, congenital heart disease in neonates and pediatrics to adult congenital heart disease, both for intracardiac surgery and planning extracardiac vascular surgery. We can use 3D printing for planning ventricular assist devices or more complex transplant procedures. We can use it to plan percutaneous procedures such as cardiac cath or for adult structural or non-congenital heart disease such as aortic valve disease. This is a growth industry that we're in for cardiac 3D printing. Just looking at a PubMed search, it's relatively new technology in cardiology um, some of the earliest papers occurring in the early 2000s, but more recently, this has been the rate of increase in the publications. And at UCSF, this is one way we use the technology. This technology can be applied in many different ways, but at UCSF, we tend to take a 
kind of a holistic approach. And again, I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to technologies, whether it's echo, CT, cardiac cath, or MRI, or 3D printing physically, or doing virtual surgical planning, or extended reality technologies. I think they're all part of an imaging ecosystem, and we have to be selective about the technology we use and be judicious about the cost and the benefits to the patient. So at our center, we're fortunate to have um, a variety of these technologies, whether it's 3D printing or virtual technologies, such as virtual surgical planning, extended reality systems to look at the anatomy, and also biomechanical analysis and simulations such as 4D flow, et cetera, and capabilities of surface 3D scanning. And this is how it kind of comes together in our heart center. This, uh, this is kind of the tenets of the use cases for our technologies. We'd like to use these different technologies to plan smarter procedures, to achieve educational ex excellence for our trainees, to provide patient and caregiver counseling, to lead in research and innovation, and frankly, be leaders in the field with this technology. Now, day to day, this is kind of how the application happens. This is, again, a patient, a clinical case who had surgery coming up. And what you'll see is our chief surgeon, Dr. Mohan Reddy, and one of his assistant surgeons planning out the case. It's a very organic process. Uh, I'm holding the camera. I'm kind of going over the procedure with them. They have now cut into the heart, and they're kind of going through their surgical approach and the different techniques they may employ to fix this particular type of heart defect. All our models are printed in one-to-one -one scale, so hopefully the anatomy that you see is the exact anatomy that you find in the operating room. And we get feedback from our surgeons for our quality assurance, so that if anything is off by even a millimeter, I find out about it, and the next time we make sure that we fix the problem. Moving from Physical 3D printing, we also use extended reality technologies, and this is a very high-risk patient that we operated on recently. Unfortunately, it's a patient who had already undergone five open-heart surgeries, but kept developing clots in their Fontan circulation. So this is a graft that is the patient's left pulmonary artery, and this is a CT scan with the areas in dark being areas of clot. Now the patient had developed more clots in the pulmonary arteries and also a clot we discovered in the coronary artery. Uh, extremely hostile environment to go in and operate on in a patient who'd already had multiple surgeries. And what I'm not showing here is the patient also had necrotizing pneumonia of the left lung, so there was active infection in the chest. So very high risk surgery. We loaded this patient on our EchoPixel mixed reality display system. This is the same exact data set I was showing earlier, but from CT. And in this mixed reality display system, you can put on goggles. If you don't need to print something, you can just look at it in this virtual, sorry, mixed reality space. And basically use different rendering modes. This is the patient's area of necrotizing pneumonia where the lung is missing. And basically fly through the anatomy with a lot of accuracy. And this view I like to call thrombus view, where I'm pointing out to the surgeon different areas where a thrombectomy is going to be required. And basically give a full 3D experience by which a surgeon can do virtual surgical planning with uh, advanced visualization techniques. So either print, non-print, for me it doesn't matter, whatever answers the question best. A different use of extended reality technologies. This we're using for education purposes. This is my partner, Dr. Jesse Cortier on his Sira app. And this is one of our cardiac models that we've loaded onto an iPad. And he's using this $14 cube of foam called a Merge Cube that essentially when you look at it within the app, you look at the heart as we had developed the 3D model and you can use this for training and also for counseling for the families. So pretty low cost solution, but hopefully better than drawing uh, pictures on pieces of paper and trying to explain very complex anatomy with two dimensional drawings. We use this technology not just for our families, but also for our trainees, both printed models and also extended reality technologies. 
and we're working on ways to further digitize congenital specimens so we can make them available in the digital space so the information can be liberated and not just uh, exist in um, glass jars in specific institutions. I'm going to wrap up uh, by talking a little bit about the impact of 3D printing technologies. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the field is still relatively new. Most of the work has been done in cardiology over the last 10 years or so. However, we do have a pretty good evidence base for the literature. Um, we know uh, one example is this uh, review paper we put out recently. Uh, we know for trainees um, with 3D models, we can move from a C1, do one, teach one model to a simulator-based learning method, which trainees report as being more helpful for their education. For experts and more advanced users, the paradigm prior to 3D printing had been time, effort, and complications figure, uh, spent just figuring things out in the cath lab, how complex connections occurred, how things looked in areas that are hard to see, such as areas that are covered in blood, and other areas because you can't really see around corners. Well, if you have a 3D printed model, you can just hold up the model next to you in the surgical field and then do detailed pre-surgical planning, hopefully avoid pitfalls and see around corners, quote unquote, through blood and do some very detailed contingency planning that we hope leads to better surgical outcomes. And for our patients and caregivers, hopefully we're moving from a situation of complexity and ambiguity and frankly, questionable informed consent to hopefully increased understanding and involvement from the parents, from the families, by involving them in the learning process and shared decision making with 3D models. I'd like to end by taking a look at the kind of broader picture of cardiac 3D plus technologies. For this particular talk, I wanted to focus a little bit more outside of my walls here at UCSF or another uh, academic center in the US. And one of the things that we have tried to do is disseminate this information and share and learn from our colleagues all over the world. Um, I'm a member of the Society for Cardiac Magnetic Resonance or the SCMR and through this group we founded the 3D Plus Advanced uh, Visualization Special Interest Group. If you're interested, here's the website you can check out. And I'm happy to say that our membership for the 3D Plus group is international and diverse. And as I started by saying with Hari's story, these technologies, I think, are further democratizing and hopefully reducing barriers to entry for people all over the world for using some very sophisticated technology for patient care. And I am aware of the fact that these technologies are expensive, but it doesn't have to be. You don't necessarily need the latest and greatest high-end 3D printer to make some of these models. In fact, Hari's story is one of those triumphs where he used a relatively inexpensive printer, but a very high resolution printer, and produced something that was very helpful for his team back in India. And so I hope these technologies can be applied more broadly and hopefully lead to better outcomes all over the world. So in conclusion, Cardiac 3D plus technologies are applicable across the spectrum of cardiovascular disease. I believe they lead to better preparations for surgeons and interventional cardiologists. This is a growth area for imaging specialists such as myself, and it challenges us to stretch beyond the worlds of traditional echocardiography to other fields such as MRI, CT, and who knows what else. And I believe it improves training for the next generation. Finally, I think this technology is beneficial for our patients and families. And I thank you for the opportunity to present this talk. If you'd like to learn more about these technologies or our center, here is the uh, website that you can turn to, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Anwar, for the excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was highly informative and insightful. Now, I have a question. I'm an aspiring radiologist, so I'm, I really like cardiovascular imaging. And I just wanted to know, what would you say is the ideal diagnostic imaging approach for a suspected congenital heart disease in a pediatric patient? Really, I think echocardiography is still the workhorse. It's the best place to start. And I would say the majority of congenital heart disease can be diagnosed with echocardiography. 
Now, if further definition is needed for the anatomy, complex intracardiac connections or evaluation of extracardiac structures such as vasculature or lung anatomy, parenchymal disease, things like that, you've got options of cardiac MRI or CT. If there's more need for further assessment, pressures, resistance, et cetera, or evaluation of very targeted things such as coronaries or collaterals, you may need to go with uh, angiography. But echo, I would say, by and large, is the first place to start. I understand. Now, we had an audience from all over the world. We had, we, uh, you're receiving greetings from Jaime Conde from Bolivia, Dr. Matas and Dr. Yuliet from Zambia, Dr. Mulopwe from Zambia. Wait a minute. We were watched from Mexico from, by Argelia Matos and Dr. Mineiro from Brazil. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Anwar, for doing this. I really enjoyed our, your presentation. I know our audience enjoyed it and it will be available on our YouTube cha channel so that it can reach to more people and, and educate others on and 3D printing. I, I was, I'm not too familiar on it and I'm sure that our audience would appreciate your, your webinar as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I really believe in the work that Health for the World does. And if I can help with anything, my email address is right here. You're welcome to reach out. Thank you so Thank much again, Dr. Anwar. Really, okay. and, a, and a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Take have, care. Have a good evening. Take care.